Hi, my friends. Welcome to The Unfolding Restoration. My name is Anthony Sweat. This is video 19 in this series uh, where we're going to talk about the establishment and purpose of the Relief Society. I am so excited uh, to share this video with you and to understand it uh, together and to see how it fits in as the restoration unfolded line upon line and precept upon precept. As I begin this video, uh, something that's interesting is this. For the most part, uh, it seems from in the 1830s, Joseph focused mostly on the men of the church. He was very focused on, it kind of began with, all right, let's organize the church, let's get everybody baptized. But beginning in June 1831, he starts to really focus in on concepts of like high priesthood, of endowment of power. He starts to shift his attention to Zion in Missouri and let's build Zion up. Uh, where is Zion going to be? Uh, he then starts to shift his attention to the School of the Prophets and the building of the temple in Kirtland. And that and many of the other issues that happened during that entire decade seem to make it so Joseph doesn't actually focus in a lot on what are the role of the women of the church. He focused a lot on the elders and the School of the Prophets and Zion and the temple. What about the role of the women? Uh, and in Nauvoo, uh, in the 1840s, specifically in 1842 with the establishment of the Relief Society, Joseph is really going to start to zero it in on the women of the church. As a matter of fact, he will say that the church is not properly organized until the women are organized. Of course, uh, it's not properly organized until half of God's children are organized within the kingdom as well. And I love that idea. It's important for us all to understand. I hope this video helps us all to understand uh, better uh, the nature and purpose of Relief Society and its essential role, its central role in the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, uh, how does it start? How does Relief Society start? Well, Joseph would encourage everybody back to temple to help build the temple. In Nauvoo, they're starting to build the Nauvoo temple. There are two women, one named Sarah Kimball, another named Margaret Cook, who want to organize a sewing society and to help collect and create materials to help with the temple and help the temple workers. So they want to, um, at that time, when uh, they formed societies, it was, it was common in antebellum America to form a society and to have a constitution and bylaws about how the society works. So they reach out to another great woman of the Restoration. Very wisely, they reach out to Eliza R. Snow, who's a wonderful, beautiful writer and thinker. And, and Eliza R. Snow says, oh, I'll draft up your bylaws for this uh, uh, this sewing society connected to the work of the temple and building the temple. Uh, and they present their ideas to Joseph of like, we're going to create this society, and they show them their bylaws and constitution. Uh, Joseph Smith compliments them and says, quote, but this is not what you want. Uh, nothing like having that answer uh, from the prophet. He says, quote, tell the sisters their offering is accepted of the Lord, and he has something better for them. I invite them all to meet with me and a few of the brethren next Thursday afternoon, and I will organize the women under the priesthood after the pattern of the priesthood. Joseph not only wants them to organize a society to help, he wants it to be a central part of the church under priesthood organization, meaning a president and counselors, and with priesthood authority, meaning they're vested with authority to act in their calling and in their station to help uh, uh, save the souls of men equal with the elders. And so on March 17, 1842, and one of the only, in Nauvoo, they only have a few places where they can hold larger meetings, but he uh, meets with a number of women and a few other men in the upper room of Joseph's red brick store. There's a larger gathering space up there in Nauvoo, Illinois, and they organize, they officially organize the Relief Society. One of the first questions is, well, who should be our our president. Now, today in the church, we're used to the, uh, you know, a presiding uh, authority, a stake president or a bishop um, giving a calling uh, to organize, or, you know, the bishop saying, this is who I want to call to be the next Relief Society president. Well, at this time, uh, they opened it up. It was very democratic. They opened up and said, who should we have as our president? And they quickly nominate Emma Smith to be the president of the society. Uh, and the vote is unanimous. They call her the Presidentus Elect. I like that title, Presidentus Elect. And Emma chooses Sarah Cleveland and Elizabeth Whitney, her good friend, uh, as her counselors. 
John Taylor, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, is there, and he sets apart uh, Emma and uh, Sarah Cleveland and Elizabeth Whitney as her counselors. And uh, Joseph reads at this first meeting, uh, reads what we know in our Doctrine and Covenants today as section 25, the revelation to Emma Smith, where the Lord uh, calls Emma an elect lady or a chosen lady. And Joseph says that Emma being chosen to preside at the society fulfills uh, the prophecy or the call from God in section 25. Uh, in Joseph's words, he says, she was called an elect lady, elected to preside. A wonderful connection there from, again, in this unfolding restoration, a revelation given clear back in 1830 that takes until 1842 uh, to see its full fruition with the Relief Society start to come forward. Emma Smith stood up at this first meeting and she remarked, quote, we are going to do something extraordinary. We expect extraordinary occasions and pressing calls, end of quote. One of the first questions was, what should they call themselves? Now, I've just been calling it the Relief Society because that's what we call it today. Um, and they, they want to know, what, what is our name? What, what do we call themselves? Joseph gives them some procedures, some counseling procedures about a chair and a motion and who can speak, and he tells them to speak openly and to speak candidly. Well, here's some of the minutes from the meeting. Moved by Counselor Cleveland and seconded by Counselor Whitney that this society be called the Nauvoo Female Relief Society. Elder Taylor offered an amendment that it be called the Nauvoo Female Benevolent Society, which would give a more definite and extended idea of the institution that relief be struck out and benevolent be inserted. Now, I'm going to pause there for a second. It's so interesting that at this very first, the first time the women start to be organized, <laughs> the men stick their foot right in and try to take control. In particular, that it's a, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles saying, I think you should call it this. I don't know if there was a little bit of pressure. They're still trying to figure out how to operate in a council. But back to the minutes when they say, when Elder Taylor says, I think you should call it the Benevolent Society. The motion was seconded by Councilor Cleveland and unanimously carried on the amendment by Elder Taylor. The president, Emma Smith, presidentess, then suggested that she would like an argument with Elder Taylor on the words relief and benevolence. I love that Emma, it's not quite sitting right with Emma. And she says, I, I, I want to talk about this a little bit. And I love this. Next line in the minutes. Motion for adjournment by Elder Richards. It's almost like, I want an argument with Elder Taylor and uh, Willard Richards is like, I think we should take a break. Joseph Smith objects and basically says, Let them, let's carry the dialogue forward. Uh, back to the minutes. President Emma Smith said that the popularity of the word benevolent is one of the great objections. No person can think of the word as associated with public institutions. One of her arguments is there's lots of benevolent societies out there. We don't want to pattern ourselves after the world. We want to do something a little bit different uh, on it. Sarah Cleveland then spoke up. And she actually said, I actually do like and support the word relief a little bit better. Eliza R. Snow spoke up and said the same thing. Back to the minutes, quote, Elder Taylor arose and said, I shall have to concede the point. Your arguments are so potent, I cannot stand before them. Joseph Smith himself also said, quote, I also have to concede the point, because he expressed a little reservations about the word relief himself. Back to the minutes, Counselor Whitney moved that this society be called the Nauvoo Female Relief Society seconded by Councillor Cleveland. Eliza R. Snow offered an amendment by way of transposition of words. You can see her, Eliza R. Snow is such a wonderful thinker and writer. And she says, uh, let's look at these words. Instead of the Nauvoo Female Relief Society, it shall be called the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo, seconded by President Joseph Smith and carried. The previous question was then put, shall this society be called the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo? Carried unanimously. Now, why did I want to take a minute up front to share that interesting history? Because I think it's very applicable um, to the modern church today. You see an example of councils and counseling happened. You see where there might, maybe if I'm reading into it, and I apologize if maybe I'm reading history a little wrong there, there might have been some pressure just to quickly agree, which sometimes in church councils, we just want to agree really quickly uh, so that there's no contention. Let's not uh, think that just because there's a disagreement or a diverging of opinions or a different view that that's contention. Contention is different than disagreement. Uh, we know that the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, they've said it in some of their talks, that in their councils, they have differing opinions. They have disagreements. 
We can disagree, as President Hinckley said, without being disagreeable. And in fact, in the Council of 50 Minutes, another council that Joseph sets up in Nauvoo, in those recently published minutes by the Joseph Smith paper, Joseph said that one of our problems in councils is that we don't agree to disagree long enough to select the pure gold from the dross, is what he says. Sometimes if there's something that isn't settling right, as you're in a church council, maybe you're in a, uh, a Relief Society presidency or a Young Women's presidency or a youth council, a ward council, if a family council in particular, if something isn't settling right, don't have agreement be your first goal. Have getting it right and, ha and have revelation be your first goal. And sometimes revelation comes by people expressing their diverging views so that we can see things from all angles. I'm so grateful on this very first occasion of the Relief Society to see Emma Smith not hesitate to speak her mind and to speak her opinion and to say, I disagree, I see this differently uh, uh, in a spirit of, of, of uh, loving meekness and intelligence, seeking for the right way, and then that counsel uh, to, to continue. Anyway, just a side tangent, but a great invitation for all of us, uh, women and men, as we participate in church councils, to share our views, to share them openly, but to share them lovingly and humbly as well as we seek for the right answers on things. Well, back to the Relief Society, what was their purpose? Eliza R. Snow says, we were told by Joseph Smith that the same organization existed in the church anciently. I love that quote. That's quoted in the first 50 years of Relief Society. Now, I don't think in the ancient church they called themselves the Relief Society or the, uh, the Female Relief Society of Nauvoo, of course. But I think what Eliza R. Snow is getting at and what other uh, Relief Society presidents and uh, leaders of the church have taught us is that this idea that there was an organized, empowered, authorized organization of women in the church anciently, and that the church always uh, needs that to happen. Uh, in their original uh, meeting, uh, in their first meeting, they say that their purpose, quote, the object of this society, that the society of sisters might provoke the brethren to good works, to looking to the wants of the poor, searching after objects of charity, and in administering to their wants, to assist by correcting the morals and strengthening the virtues of the female community is what they say their goal is. Joseph, in another meeting, adds a little amendment. Joseph says that it is for the relief of the poor, the destitute, the widow, and the orphan, and for the exercise of all benevolent purposes. And then he adds this wonderful line, it's not only to relieve the poor, but to save souls, end of quote. I love that, and I love that the book of James says that this is pure religion, uh, that we offer up relief and service uh, to those who are in need with the intent to help provide for their temporal needs, to help lead them unto salvation uh, as a whole, to save souls. The work of Relief Society is part of and essential to the work of salvation of souls, and that was given uh, at the very beginning of the organization of the Relief Society. I love this in some of these early meetings, by the way, uh, women start to want to join it and join in. My own fourth great-grandmother, as I'm showing here on this image from uh, the eighth meeting of the uh, Nauvoo Female Relief, uh, Female Relief Society of Nauvoo, I should use the right term. Um, my own fourth great-grandmother, her name was Polly Sweat, you can see her there, uh, attended that meeting. And in, when you read these early minutes, you see them caring for each other looking after the needs of one another. This sister needs this. How do we help her? This sister needs this. These, this family needs this. This brother needs this. Uh, donating money, donating items, trading goods. There's some beautiful examples of this sister needs this and doesn't have it. And this sister says, well, I can do that. And I need this. And this sister goes, well, I can do that for you. And they, uh, in essence, trade off service with each other. So they have this practical relieve, soul, uh, relieve suffering and relieve and help people in their want but they also have a higher purpose. I like to call the Relief Society the School of the Prophetesses, and I still like to call it that today, and I don't think it's inappropriate. They, in particular, Nauvoo, saw themselves as a school of prophets or prophetesses. Um, one of the reasons why I say that is because the, er the early Relief Society only accepted women who were worthy. It was not every woman 18 or older uh, as it is today. They were very intent of this society is for uh, righteous, covenant-keeping women. 
Their notes say, quote, none should be received into the society but those who are worthy, end of quote, coming from the prophet Joseph Smith. And you can see in their minutes where they, certain women's names come up and they do not allow them into their society. Uh, and that point could be debated right or wrong. But the point I want you to understand is that they wanted it to be for women who are worthy because they viewed themselves as uh, called and authorized in the work of salvation, just like the elders were. Joseph seemed to view the early Relief Society as a preparatory grounds, a temple preparation for the women. It's not coincidental that as the Relief Society is being organized in the spring of 1842, Joseph is also preparing to administer the first temple endowment ceremonies, which I'll talk about uh, in a later video. At one of the meetings, just to show this connection of this school of the prophetesses, uh, or this connection of the temple, Joseph says, quote, he was going to make of this society a kingdom of priests, as in Enoch's day. I love that quote. He's viewing them in the same way that he's viewing the elders. He says to the elders, I want to make you great high priests uh, like uh, Abraham. Now he's turning to the women and saying, I want to make you great high priestesses or a kingdom of priests like uh, Sarah uh, or in Enoch's day, uh, Adam's and Eve's, Abraham's and Sarah's. Uh, so to speak. Uh, at another uh, lecture on April 28th of 1842, Joseph gave, quote, a lecture on the priesthood, showing how the sisters would come in possession of the privileges, blessings, and gifts of the priesthood. He's connecting that directly to the temple and its ordinances, but he's teaching it through the Relief Society. You're seeing this preparatory ground. Because of all of this, some of the early women did view themselves as a female school of the prophets. Phoebe Woodruff uh, says uh, they likened it to a school of the prophets uh, uh, to prepare them for it. Later on in Utah, uh, when uh, the Relief Society was organized here, Fillmore State President Thomas Callister saw a connection between the Relief Society and the school of the prophets, saying, this society reminds me of the school of the prophets and we might almost call you a school of the prophetesses. Love that idea. By the way, in connection, Emma Smith will become the first woman uh, to receive the temple endowment ceremonies that I'll, uh, and ordinances that I'll talk about uh, later, and she will administer them to other women, mostly within the Relief Society uh, uh, confines. To the Relief Society, Joseph Smith taught about and used other temple-centric ideas like this, he taught them, the women, quote, that the keys of the kingdom are about to be given to them, that they may be able to detect everything false as well as the elders, that iniquity must be purged out. Then the veil will be rent and the blessings of heaven will flow down. And to the women, he said, if you live up to your privilege, the angels cannot be restrained from being your associates. Females, if they are pure and innocent, can come into the presence of God. Now, the reason why I'm connecting this to a school of the prophets is because these are the same teachings that he was giving the elders back in the June 1831 conference. They need to be pure. They need to be worthy. They need to receive priesthood ordinances and covenants. If so, they can rend the veil. Angels will minister to them. They can come into the presence of God and have his power with them. He's teaching these women the exact same thing in the Nauvoo uh, Relief Society. Because of that, in their Relief Society, they also, in their meetings, they exercised spiritual gifts, just like the elders did. The elders had visions and prophesied and, and healed and spoke in tongues. The women of the Nauvoo, of the uh, Female Relief Society of Nauvoo, did the exact same thing. Uh, you read their minutes. Uh, in one of the minutes I love, they say, we don't have a lot of business to attend to. So they turn to uh, more spiritual exercising of gifts. Uh, women stand up and prophesy. Another woman stands up and speaks in tongues, and another woman interprets it. Uh, although, by the way, Joseph did give a caution in general not to indulge too much in the speaking of tongues and interpretation of it. Could you imagine if we had to say that in the church today? Don't indulge too much in the gift of tongues. One of the uh, interesting things that you may not know is that at this time in the church, women gave healing blessings of faith. They laid their hands on people and healed them of their infirmities and problems. At the close of the April 19, 1842 meeting, uh, quote, Miss Elizabeth Davis Durfee bore testimony to the great blessing she received when administered to after the close of last meeting by President Emma Smith and Counselors Cleveland and Whitney. 
She said she never realized more benefit through any administration, that she was healed and thought the sisters had more faith than the brethren. Truer words probably never were spoken. Uh, I love that line in there. And this, by the way, women exercising these, what they viewed as gifts of the Spirit, empowered um, um, by, by their authority that they were given, they would exercise these sort of spiritual gifts of faith and give healing blessings of faith. These healing blessings, by the way, um, go on for almost 100 years in the church. At the Relief Society, Joseph Smith gave some instruction on healing, on women giving healing. President Smith, that's Joseph Smith, offered instruction respecting the propriety of females administering to the sick by the laying on of hands. Said it was according to Revelation. If the sisters should have faith to heal the sick, let all hold their tongues and let everything roll on. Respecting the female laying on of hands, he further remarked there could be no devil in it if God gave his sanction by healing, that there could be no more sin in any female laying hands on the sick than in wetting the face with water that it is no sin for anybody to do it that has faith, or if the sick has faith to be healed by the administration. Notice that they're seeing it as a gift of faith, a gift of the Spirit. As an artist, I wanted to give some representation to this, this practice that went on in the church. Uh, this is a, a painting that I call Relief Society Healing, showing some women of the Relief Society administering to another woman uh, in her need. Uh, this practice goes on uh, for about a hundred years in the church. From 1830 to 1930, women would give these healing blessings of faith. I don't have time to completely go into it into this video. If you want to read an excellent article on it, it's called Female Ritual Healing in Mormonism. Female Ritual Healing in Mormonism uh, by Jonathan Stapley and Kristen Wright. They give the whole history of it and why at the turn of the century in the 1900s, uh, the decision was made by church leaders and some Relief Society leaders and things that were going on in the church to begin to move away from women giving these healing blessings of faith. I should say that our current general handbook of instructions says that only uh, elders who hold the Melchizedek priesthood should give uh, lay on hands for healing blessings uh, today. And in this painting, by the way, that I'm, that I'm showing you, the reason why I wanted to show it to you, I, I'm not advocating any particular position about women uh, and priesthood blessings or laying on of hands. I want to give a historical image so we understand that this went on in the Relief Society. Uh, I love the idea of women coming together in love and faith to comfort and care for and strengthen and heal and to minister to each other uh, by the power of God that's available to them through their covenants and by the Holy Ghost. Uh, what I want to celebrate in this painting here is women who know their divine potential and how to call upon the powers of heaven to help them accomplish the work of salvation. That's what Relief Society is all about, and then and now. There are more ways to heal than laying on of hands. That's important. If anybody feels restricted, which is understandable, by not being able to give lay on hands today in the church of a healing blessing of faith, let's understand that there are many ways to bring healing into uh, people's lives. I hope that's what you see uh, in this painting and more. Uh, central to the painting, by the way, if you, if you zoom in here on it, are the intermixed hands in the middle. I love this. You know, these hands praying, these hands supporting, these hands strengthening. How it symbolizes the unity and care that early Latter-day Saint women experienced um, in the Relief Society ministry with each other uh, as a whole. Uh, I hope that uh, you see uh, things like this in this painting. And that's how these women viewed uh, their early Relief Society connection to each other, to bear each other up to strengthen, to comfort, to heal, to teach, to minister, to correct, um, uh, to offer relief uh, as a whole. The Female Relief Society of Nauvoo uh, functioned on and off, 1842, 43, 44, but in 1845, the Relief Society was ceased, or it was stayed, or was not allowed to meet for a time. Well, why? It happens directly after Joseph Smith's death. Uh, what goes on? Well, one of the things that seems to happen is that by 1844, Emma Smith uh, wants to put a stop or put a halt to the uh, private practice of plural marriage. In a later video, I'll talk about plural marriage uh, that was being practiced in Nauvoo, but in summary, understand that 99% of the church did not know that plural marriage was happening. Uh, plural marriage was only introduced to a select few people in private in Nauvoo. It was not taught openly until the church started to come westward 
and became established here in Utah. So Emma Smith, with a lot of the women in the Relief Society, would not have known that plural marriage was happening. Some of the women didn't know. Obviously, people like Eliza R. Snow uh, and others uh, who had been married uh, in plural marriages, some to the prophet Joseph Smith knew what was happening. But in 1844, Emma seems to say, let's put a stop to this as a whole. Uh, she mounts a direct effort to oppose uh, plural marriage using her position as Relief Society president. In March of 1844, there's four uh, meetings that are held, and in each of those uh, meetings, Emma Smith has uh, this thing called the Voice of Innocence that I'll tell you about read and talked about. She makes some pretty bold statements. She says things like, if there ever was any authority on the earth, she had it, uh, Emma Smith does, and that what she said to the Relief Society was law for the women. She's the president of the women. Well, she has this document that was written by W.W. Phelps uh, called The Voice of Innocence, read and ratified. The Voice of Innocence basically uh, defends the virtue and uh, extols uh, and promotes the virtue of women, uh, of chastity within the church, saying that they are, they are moral women, they are righteous women, they're virtuous women, and that they abhor and that they reject any form of immorality, such as prostitution or fornication or adultery, or polygamy as a whole. Now, that's difficult um, um, because some of the women in the room were in plural marriages uh, as this Voice of Innocence document is being read. Uh, the, the book, The First 50 Years of Relief Society from the Church Historians Press says, quote, clearly Emma Smith tried to win women's full support for putting down iniquity, and she seemed to have mounted an intensified effort at what she considered moral reform, with the intent to halt all plural marriage, including the practice authorized by her husband. According to a later reminiscence of John Taylor, John Taylor said, quote, Sister Emma made use of the position that she held to try to pervert the minds of the sisters, and taught the sisters that the practice of celestial marriage or plural marriage, as taught and practiced by Joseph Smith the prophet, was not of God. One of the problems is after the March 1844 Voice of Innocence document comes out, there seems to be a hint of hypocrisy in it because some of the men of Nauvoo who also oppose plural marriage, they know that uh, Joseph Smith and some of these women are, uh, have entered into plural marriage practices. So then you have these public denials by Joseph or these public documents rejecting it. Uh, and it seems to mount uh, or add to the mounting fury that's coming against the prophet in the spring of 1844 by certain dissenters from the church. Joseph Smith blamed the Voice of Innocence document for some of this uh, opposition against him. He said, quote, he never had any fuss with these men, those who were opposing him and calling him a fallen prophet, until that female relief society brought out that paper against adulterers and adulteresses. Now, uh, that might be a little unfair on Joseph's part. Uh, Joseph had a lot of problem with some of these dissenters uh, long before uh, the Voice of Innocence document came out, but it did seem to contribute uh, to the problems as a whole. This is partly what led, I hope you understand, then Joseph Smith will be uh, killed and shot to death in Carthage jail in June of 1844. And then there's the succession crisis after he dies when him and Hiram are both martyred. Who's in charge and who leads the church? Well, there are different things that were put out there. Well, maybe it should be William Smith, Joseph's younger brother, because he's now the patriarch of the church and he's a member of the Twelve. Uh, Sidney Rigdon says, well, maybe I should lead the church because I was the first counselor and we'll talk about all about this. Uh, Brigham Young says, no, at, at when the prophet's killed, the first presidency dissolves and we are the Twelve and we hold all the keys of the kingdom. We're now the highest governing body. Um, and we have the keys and the ordinances, and that's where the keys rest is with the Twelve and the president of the Twelve. Well, Emma Smith is actually going to want uh, the Nauvoo stake president. Uh, it seems for a time she says, I think William Marks should be the leader of the church because he's the stake president of Nauvoo, and Nauvoo is the center place of the gathering. Almost kind of like a bishop of Rome thing becomes the pope. The Nauvoo stake president should become the church president. Well, those are all interesting thoughts, and obviously Brigham and the Twelve are the one that are sustained by the church as the rightful authority, but the reason why I'm sharing this with you is because it seems that one of the reasons that Emma Smith 
doesn't want to necessarily support Brigham in the 12 is not only because her and Brigham butt heads about a lot of things uh, in their personality and in their views, but also because Emma does not want plural marriage to continue in the church. And she knows that if Brigham and the 12 lead the church, that plural marriage will continue in the church because Brigham and many of them, through her husband Joseph, have already entered into plural marriages. And somebody like William Marks does not support uh, plural marriage. It seems to be some of her motive. So because of this, uh, some of this tension over the private practice of plural marriage, Brigham asks the Relief Society to stay or to not meet so that their Emma doesn't uh, uh, lead to further confusion over the succession question about why the 12 shouldn't be in charge as a whole. So during this about 10-year period of time, as then the church uh, finished the temple in Nauvoo and came westward, the Relief Society did not meet, did not function. Under Brigham Young's direction, they begin to meet again as a whole. And begin in 1866-67, Brigham Young then calls on relief societies to be reorganized out in the Utah Territory uh, for every ward uh, as a whole. I want you to see it, that it's not that Brigham Young doesn't support the relief society. It's that Brigham Young didn't want Emma to lead to confusion over the succession question seems to be the more uh, driving factor. Uh, to show this, when the Relief Society was, re Relief Society was reorganized here uh, in uh, Utah, Brigham says, now bishops, you have smart women for wives. Let them organize female Relief Societies in the various wards. We have many talented women among us, and we wish their help in this matter. Some may think this is a trifling thing, but it is not. And you will find that the sisters will be the mainspring of the movement. Give them the benefit of your wisdom and experience. Give them your influence. Guide and direct them wisely and well and they will find rooms for the poor and obtain the, the means for supporting them 10 times quicker than even bishops could. Eliza R. Snow becomes the next, what we would call today, General Relief Society president over the church and helps oversee this reorganization of the Relief Society in the Utah Territory. And she says, quote, if any of the daughters and mothers in Israel are feeling in the least circumscribed or limited in their present spheres, they will now find ample scope through the Relief Society for every power and capacity for doing good with which they are most liberally endowed." End of quote. And today the Relief Society has continued. Uh, it's one of the great organizations in the world and in the church. It's perhaps, by the way, the largest women's organization. Uh, there are over 7 million women who belong to the Relief Society, spread throughout 170 countries across the world. Uh, as I mentioned today, uh, any uh, woman uh, who's a member of the church, 18 and older, is automatically uh, advanced and becomes a member of the Relief Society. The church's general handbook of instructions today summarizes the Relief Society as, quote, helping God's children prepare to return to his presence. It is a divinely instituted organization to save souls and relieve suffering. You see them tapping in to those phrases from the early formation of the Relief Society. As I conclude, if you want to study more about the Relief Society, I would highly recommend these two books from the church. One is called Daughters in My Kingdom that was published, uh, The History and Work of the Relief Society. Another great scholarly source as a whole is called The First 50 Years of Relief Society, uh, Key Documents in Latter-day Saint Women's History, published by the Church Historians Press. Uh, I've read both of these books and devoured them, and they're great, great resources to better understand the essential work uh, of the women. I want to conclude by saying that when Joseph organized the Relief Society, he said, this is the beginning of better days for women. And remember, Joseph Smith said, this church is not properly organized until the women are organized and empowered through the Relief Society. Elder M. Russell Ballard of the Quorum of the Twelve said, the work of the kingdom of God cannot fulfill its true destiny without rolling forward hand in hand with the faithful, wonderful sisters of the church, end of quote. And I believe that is very true, that the restoration will unfold as women and men work hand in hand, jointly and equally together. Eliza R. Snow said this, quote, it is no ordinary thing to meet in an organization of this nature. The organization, Relief Society, belongs to the organization of the Church of Christ in all dispensation when it is in its perfection. And I believe that this church will continue in its perfection and trying to work toward its perfection, its ideals, and lofty goals as the work of Relief Society is implemented, understood, embraced, and ratified in the ongoing restoration. God bless you and God bless me uh, in that work together.